Good evening, my name is Tammy. I'm your connection guide here at Single Life today and we're presenting internet security, using the internet safely, not only at home, but on the road. All of us are avid travelers and you may think that it's safe out there, but it's not. And tonight we have the privilege of hearing firsthand information from an expert in the field. His name is Mark Haas, and Mark is currently the chief architect at Amdocs Optima. And he is, he and his team drive the overall software and technical architecture for Amdocs Optima products. This is a mouthful, but the products consist of robust cloud-based billing system and rafting engine, rating engine, an open business and integration layer, and smart user interfaces to support his clients, business management, and billing functions, including e-commerce. So if anybody really understand what that was, then let me know afterwards and you get a prize. I can't wait to hear Mark present because that was a mouthful for me. But one of the main areas that Mark is responsible for is the security and architecture and design of the products from his company. He received his BS in computer science engineering from Tulane University and an MS in management from the University of Texas in Dallas. He's a published professional photographer, a volunteer and officer with the Mount Laurel Emergency Medical Services, a wine collector, and an avid traveler with Singles Travel International. So with all that great accolade, I introduce to you Mark Haas. Mark, we're very excited to have you here tonight. Thanks so much for joining. Well, thank you, Tammy, and thanks to everybody for uh, attending. Uh, we'll get right into it because I have a lot to present. So let me just start sharing and let me pick the right piece here and we'll get going. So the first part of the presentation is about being safe and secure online. And, and this presentation comes from the Center for Cyber Safety and Education, which is a, a division of the ISC squared, which is one of the first um, security related uh, professional certification agencies. And they sponsor several of the alphabet soup type credentials that people have related to computer security. So we're going to talk about how to stay safe online and how to protect yourself. And sort of like Dan said uh, in the introductions before we started the recording, there is no perfect way to stay safe in the internet. Just like you can't stay 100% safe in your home or in your neighborhood. The, the idea here is to be aware of the potential uh, places where you can get in trouble and try to avoid them. There's also the idea of just do more than your neighbor because the criminals are always looking for the easy mark. If you make it a little more difficult than most people, they're going to go after the other people and not you. So one of the things that we really need to do is make sure that we're aware of what can go on online. That's not be scared. You don't want to be paranoid. You don't want to basically say, okay, I'm never turning my computer on again. But you also want to be aware of what can happen. So when we talk about being online, what do we do online? Some people you are online mostly to connect with other people. It could be your friends, your family, uh, things like that. Uh, some people bank and shop. Uh, a lot of people watch movies, do Netflix, HBO Max. Uh, some people play uh, multiplayer online games, other things that you do. What, where, where that applies is knowing what you do and understanding some of the piece parts that happen and the threats on the internet. It helps you to understand what people are talk, like me are talking about. So there are a few terms that I'm sure you've heard and you 
may think you know what they are, but we'll just talk about them really briefly. Malware, that's any software that maliciously gets installed on your computer that either gives the people who got the malware installed on your computer control of your computer, access to it, uh, access to your personal and private information, stuff you don't want uh, other people to know, including user IDs and passwords. Um, phishing, uh, and phishing in this case is with a PH and not an F, just to distinguish it. Um, there's probably some history there of where that came from. I don't know it off the top of my head. But phishing is uh, when you get things like emails that look like they're from somebody or some organization you know that are asking you to share a link, click on this, uh, go to this website to, to change something. Uh, anything that looks legitimate, mostly an email, but it actually is happening now with texts also, that they're trying to get you to click on something that will let them install the malware or get you to input personal information. Um, we all hear about the cloud and what's the difference between the cloud and the internet? Well, in reality, in this case, they're pretty much interchangeable. In a more technical definition, the internet is more about the, the, the infrastructure that moves the data and the cloud is a bunch of servers on the internet that you don't know that it's really a server. Uh, uh, Google, Amazon, um, uh, uh, Microsoft Azure, various cloud uh, you know, uh, vendors, but for our purposes, the cloud and the internet are the same thing. Wi-Fi is a protocol, which is just a, a, a standard way for things to communicate wirelessly from your computer to connect to a local network and then to the internet. And where Wi-Fi comes in when it comes to being secure is while there, there's security protocols in Wi-Fi, but where we get in trouble a lot is using public Wi-Fi because public Wi-Fi is very easy for a cyber criminal to monitor what's going on and intercept traffic if the Wi-Fi isn't secured really well. And in the last five to 10 years, we've also had to deal with things called apps. And apps are, th are things that you install on your phone. Everything from the Zoom app, if you're using Zoom on your phone, to apps to play games, apps to do shopping. Amazon has an app. Your bank has an app. Everybody has an app. And very often one of the the places where security goes awry is in badly crafted apps. So, Mark, um, this is Robbie. Could you explain phishing before you go? Because I was had to run off for a second. Sure. Okay. So, very quickly, phishing is typically an email that looks legitimate. Okay, got it. Yeah, it's, you know, and it, it can, there's really two types of phishing. There's more general phishing where you get an email that looks like it's from your bank saying there's a problem with your account, click here to fix it. Or there's, there's what we call social engineering phishing where you'll get an email from, it looks like from somebody you know. It could be from your boss. It could be from an executive in the company. It could be from one of your uh, relatives, something like that, where it looks legitimate and they're trying to get you to do something that may even sound legitimate, but in the end is uh, going to get them access to your computer or money or whatever. Thank you. Okay. So we talked about malware. That's people putting software on your computer that does bad things. Uh, you know, viruses, um, you know, all sorts of things. 
it's very important pretty much on any computer, a, a Windows computer, a Mac, uh, a Chromebook, whatever, they all have built-in antivirus software these days. And you should make sure it's on the computer. You should make sure it, it's running and you should make sure you've set it up to auto update. So you get all the updates. This is sort of the first line of defense. Uh, so, you know, that's sort of, I won't say it's rule number one, but it's one of the important things to do. In Windows, you pretty much just have to set Windows update to automatically update. Uh, in, in Macs, it's very similar. So um, you don't have to go buy a third party program. Uh, it comes with the operating system. Just make sure it's configured. So this is very similar, security updates. Um, there are always new security threats. Literally about, I don't know, 200 to 300 a week that affect Windows uh, and, and, and Apple OS and Linux. Um, it, the, if, if you actually looked at the database, I think we're in July and we're pushing 40,000 uh, uh, security issues, uh, vulnerabilities found so far in 2021. So it's important to make okay. sure that somebody else. Okay. okay, there's a little echo there, no problem. Um, so again, another reason to make sure that your security updates are turned on. Windows does a once a month update. It's update Tuesdays. I think it's the second Tuesday of the month. Um, they occasionally push a, uh, an emergency one. Uh, all the browsers, Chrome, Safari, uh, Firefox, Edge, also push updates out. Um, and any software that you use like Office or QuickBooks or whatever, almost all software packages these days uh, have a way to set up auto updates. And if you turn on auto updates, that's the easiest thing. It will keep things up to date. And unlike in the past, very, very rarely does a security update ever cause any issues. So you're, you know, in like 10 years ago, people didn't turn security updates on because they very often broke things. The process is much better now. Turn on, turn on auto updates. Don't worry about it after that. So we were talking about passwords and Robbie's right. Um, you know, the, the, the general industry recommendation is have a different password for every place you need a password. And then what Robbie talked about is what actually uh, happens. You forget half of them, especially if it's a site you don't go to very often. And then you're stuck with either getting it reset or people write it down on a piece of paper and, and, and that's very bad. Um, so there are a couple rules about good passwords. Um, one is the longer the better. So, and, and, and I'm, I'm not going to say this is, this is the way to do it, but if you had a phrase like gone with the wind, don't use that. That's one of the first things people check when they're hacking, but a phrase better is better than uh, a um, you know, just a few letters. Eight character minimum with no repetitive or sequential characters. Like A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D is almost as bad as P, A, S, S, W, O, R, D. And there was a survey a few years ago where they, they looked at popular uh, websites and literally 15% of the, 
of the passwords to the site or you know password with an uppercase p a lowercase p or password one um, so don't do that um, again no commonly used passwords and no contact specific words so for example if you're logging in to your gmail account you know, don't use Google one, two, three or Gmail uh, four, five, six. Um, two factor authentication. We'll, we'll talk about what that is, but you know, you're pretty much all used to it uh, because a lot of banking sites and all that have it. It's you, you type in your user ID and password, and then they ask you for uh, like a code. Today, most of the time, they'll send it to you via text. So you log into your bank account with your user ID and password. Then they send your phone that's linked to your account, a six character, you know, six digits, and then you have to type those digits in. And the, the whole idea of two factors is it's, it's based on something you know and something you have. So it, you have your phone specifically, and you have your password. And so if the person gets your phone, they don't have your password. If they hack your password, they don't have your phone. So that adds a lot of um, extra security. And make sure passwords are used on all mobile devices and computers. Um, you can set up your computer to not require a password when you uh, log in. And you can set up your phone to not have a code that you have to type in when the phone locks makes life much more convenient, but it makes it much easier for the criminal if you leave your laptop in the cafe or you lose your phone to get into it and get all your information if it's not protected with a password. So I'm gonna spend just a couple minutes here talking about a couple of strategies for harder to break passwords. So, one of the, the best strategies, which isn't really complex, is to think of a phrase like gone with the wind, but don't use the whole phrase. Use the first letter of, e, of, of each word. So G, W, T, W. But what you do then is you add something else to it like the first letter of the, not the WW part of the URL. So you have G, W, T, W, if you're logging into Amazon, A. So now you have five letters. Now, somewhere between those letters in a common pattern, you now put some number they easily remember, like the address number of the house you grew up in. For me, the address number was 8925. So I'm now GWTW, and maybe I put 8925 in between the W and the T. So it's GW8925TWA for Amazon. Now, the last thing you do is you say every other letter is a capital or a lowercase. So lowercase g capital W, 8925, lowercase t, capital W, lowercase a. That's an, an, what we call an algorithm, but it's a pattern that you can remember. You can change it for different websites. So for um, you know, Twitter, instead of ending with an A, it ends with a T. For Netflix, it would end with an N. And then you can have different passwords, but if you always use the same pattern, you'll always remember it. Now, some sites allow or require a special character. So what you do with the special character, the thing you don't want to do, because this is the number one special character people use, you know, they'll do P-A-S-S-W-R-D exclamation point. And why do they use the exclamation point? Because it's the character that's the capital on top of one. 
So uh, what, what, what you can do is you can say, okay, I'm gonna put the special character in the middle of the number. So now my password is lowercase g, capital W, 89, and I use at sign, at sign, 25. Now I'm back to lowercase uh, t, uppercase w, lowercase a. That's my password for Amazon. Now, I, I will tell you that is not my real password for Amazon. Sorry, friends. But that that's, an, that's a way to build passwords that if you consistently use the same pattern, you can have a different password for many sites. You can include a spe the special character or not, depending upon whether the site allows it. You have uppercase letters, lowercase letters, and numbers, and the password is at least eight, nine, 10 characters long. So that's one pattern. Another pattern that I often use is a, an old address, like as a longer phrase. Like my, one of my old addresses uh, from where I grew up, 8925 Birch Avenue. And then I'll throw in a couple of, um, a, a couple of special characters in between the words. So 8925 at Birch, uh, exclamation point avenue. And that's when you need a longer phrase. So those, those are a couple of ways to do it. What you can do is there are many apps now that you can put on your phone, you can load on your computer that are actually password vaults. Um, you know, in fact, I know iPhones come with their own vault uh, and I think Android phones do. And essentially you have one password that secures the vault. And then inside the, the app, inside the vault, you can, stall, you can store all of your other user IDs and passwords. And, and some of the apps that both go on the phone and on your computer, when you're on your computer, you can actually just open the vault. And when you go to that site or to that particular thing, like my Gmail password, you or your Gmail account, it'll actually enter your user ID and password for the account. Um, they're not too expensive. You know, uh, I think the, the, the one I use is like $50 a year and there are lots of them, but it's an extra step. It's a little more sophisticated, but the advantage of password vaults, for example, instead of using password on Google or the Apple vault is it works everywhere. You, you can use the same password vault on your phone, on your computers, on your tablets. So you only need one password vault. And then you really only have to remember the one main password for the vault. The one thing I'll say is make sure that's a good password, <laughs> good strong password. Open Wi-Fi. you go into Starbucks, you, you're at the hotel and you go onto the hotel Wi-Fi. Uh, you're in a restaurant. Um, you're in, in the cafe in Greece uh, on one of our trips. The problem with open Wi-Fi is it's very, very easy for someone else on that same open Wi-Fi network to be monitoring the traffic going over the Wi-Fi. So I can go to Starbucks with my laptop with a generally available application and monitor all the traffic on the Wi-Fi. So if the traffic isn't encrypted, I see what's going across. Even if the traffic is encrypted because I'm on the network, um, I can use vulnerabilities in the protocols to intercept them. And, do things like what they call man in the middle attacks. So I make your computer think my computer is actually uh, Google when you're logging into your Gmail. And then on the back end, I make my computer look like it's you to Google. And I get to see all of the, the traffic that's going across the screen. So uh, there are things that can happen. So very much so, if you're connecting to a public open Wi-Fi, 
do it with caution. Make sure your phone or your tablet or your laptop is set not to auto connect. If you, you can put a setting in your computer so that if it sees a Wi-Fi it can connect to, it'll just connect. And you may end up connected on an open Wi-Fi without even knowing it. Um, so in general, if you do have to connect to an open Wi-Fi, uh, avoid banking. You, know, you probably don't want to check your email, which is maybe one of the reasons why you're connecting to the open Wi-Fi in the first place. You certainly don't want to do any shopping while you're on an open Wi-Fi. So how do you, um, let me, uh, so we'll talk about a way uh, we, you can protect yourself on open Wi-Fi a little later. Online shopping and banking. Number one thing is make sure you're really connecting to the bank and, and not something that pretending to be the bank. Um, so, you know, it shows here, you know, www.yourbank.com. That's your bank. Very good chance that www.ubank.com, just the same URL without the R, may be a site spoofing your bank. And uh, we're all pretty good at making typos and not recognizing it. So uh, that's one of the very common things that happens. These days when the bank sees somebody's trying to spoof them with a, a, a close match to the URL, they can um, go get those sites taken down. But what, what a lot of the banks do now is they try to buy up the domain names of all the very close things. So you have www.chase.com, but Chase also owns www.chase without the E or Chase without the S or, or Chase with two S's or uh, the dot .net and the .org, uh, you know, bank and the dot .info and the dot .this just to prevent people from spoofing them, from buying those close URLs. Um, always check to make sure that you see the little lock sign that tells you it's actually an HTTPS secure site um, versus an HTTP. So HTTPS basically means the connection between your browser and the website is encrypted. Today, Chrome automatically tries to force you to use the secure, the HTTPS, and will only connect you without HTTPS if the site doesn't support it. And then it'll give you a warning. Edge work doesn't quite do it that way. And I haven't been on Firefox for so long, I don't know what it does anymore. Make sure you see the little lock. I think we all know this, but uh, it's important to reinforce. Banks, will, banks, the government um, will never ask you for credit card numbers or password information via email. They just don't do that. So if you get an email from your bank, from your utility, from PayPal, whatever, basically saying, you know, we've suspended your account because of X, Y, Z, uh, please click here. 99.9% .9 of the time, that's a phishing email. What they may do is they may send you a, a, an email saying, there's a problem with your account, please contact us. And then you can go either call the bank or log into the bank website yourself. And if you're not sure if, the, if an email is legitimately from your bank or your utility company or whatever, that's what you should do. Don't click on the link in the email, close the email, open your browser and go to their website directly. And the passwords we talked about. Um, and and even if, you, if you don't try to use unique passwords for every place, if, for example, if you tend to use just the, uh, the same password or a few passwords, really make sure you use different passwords for your financial sites, because those are the places where 
you're most at risk if somebody gets your information, they can drain your account. Okay, let's switch some of the scams that are out there that people fall, you know, um, I shake my head, but, you know, people fall for these scams all the time and they're not always, you know, super naive people, um, you know, they, they, some of these are really obvious, but some of them are done pretty well and, you know, they catch people at, at the right emotional time. So some of the things are like, and some of them, and we'll talk about a few of them, fake emergencies. Um, there, there's false promises. Uh, there's the, you won a prize. Um, there, there's the, 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 you know, the, um, we have this investment with 50% return. Uh, other type of deceptive money offers phony lotteries. These type scams are much less successful than they were 10 years ago, but people still fall for them. So one of the common ones that's going on now is the you go to a website or somebody calls you and basically says, um, hey, this is uh, Mike. I'm from the Microsoft Windows uh, response team. Uh, we've, we've seen information that your computer could have been compromised. Um, I, what I need you to do is go to this website and download this tool and I'll help you so I can fix your computer. Yeah, well, Microsoft doesn't do that. So uh, it, it's, it's definitely a scam where they're trying to install malware on your computer and then they'll start capturing everything you type. And I've had every one of those. <laughs> yeah. I didn't fall for any of them. Right, though, but. right. I'm sure we all have. <laughs> um, so ransomware now is the scary thing because it's becoming almost the most prevalent scam. They, they use all of those tricks, including bogus websites and, and all that stuff to get their ransomware installed on your computer. And it could sit there and do nothing for a year. And then one day, you log in and you can't. All your, fi your, your files are locked. There's nothing there. You can't log in and you get the screen basically saying your files are encrypted. In order to obtain the key, you need to pay us $300 in Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. Um, or whatever cyber currency or non-traceable currency it is. And the problem here is, yes, they really have encrypted your disk and without the key, you can't access it. So it's a, it's a very scary thing. And once this has happened, it, there's, you, you either don't pay the ransomware and have to essentially reformat the disk and rebuild your computer. And hopefully you've backed everything up or you pay the ransomware, but there's no guarantee that when you pay it, they're gonna fix anything. There, there are some ransomware people that are more legitimate, not saying that they're legitimate, but they're more legitimate. So they'll actually unencrypt, you know, they'll, they'll send you the key and it will actually unencrypt your disk. But others, they take your money and you never see them again. So again, the, 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 the best way is to not do something that gets the ransomware installed, um, but also do, you know, back everything up relatively often to an external hard disk or an online service so that if you do get this, if you have to wipe out your computer or wipe your computer and reinstall everything, and you know, if either you can do that or you can get a service to do that, you still have all your important files and photos and all of that stuff. 
And you know, typically these ransomware people, when they're when they're attacking private individuals, the the fee isn't exorbitant. You know, they they might ask for five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. You know, when when they install ransomware on the gas pipeline uh, that that you know caused all the gas shortages a couple of months ago, they wanted twenty million dollars. So you know they, they don't make it so exorbitant that people won't pay, but it, it's it's you know keeping into the criminals. And the best way to deal with that, like I said, is have good backups, have a, a an operating system restore disk which uh, you can create and go forward. And you know rather than paying the ransom, just say okay, you got me. I'll, I'll reformat my disk rebuild everything and restore all my files from the backup. Uh, okay, we've all seen the Nigerian prince thing. I don't think I need to go into that one. Uh, but basically it's a scam where, uh, you know, uh, somebody left me a whole bunch of money. I need your help to get it. Um, in the end, they want some money to facilitate it and then they disappear. I actually had a very, very good, well-formed version of this happen to me a few months ago. I got a fax addressed to me at the MLEMS station. For, and it was on legal letterhead from an attorney who said they were in um, Newfoundland, Canada, who who's rep, you know, he's representing the estate of somebody with some first name and my last name, but the estate is tied up in the US and he needs somebody in the US to help facilitate getting this $16 million and you know, all of this stuff. So you know, I was 100% sure that this was a scam, but I, out of curiosity, I looked at it. The, it was actually a real law firm in Canada that I looked up on the web, but the person who signed it actually isn't a person in that law firm. What they did is they combined two names of two of the different lawyers in the law firm, and that's how they signed it. And the phone number of the law firm was different than the phone number on the letterhead. But the, but it was actually the legit, it was legitimate letterhead for the law firm that they had edited. So you know, they they were going to a, a and that was like a a very targeted scam. Like they found out on the internet I was an officer of Mount Laurel EMS. They targeted the name with my last name. It, it was it was a well-crafted scam, but it was a scam and no, I didn't fall for it. This is one that often will hit uh, older folks uh, who have grandchildren, especially older grandchildren. And this is this combined with monitoring social media uh, is, is very effective. Um, Somebody looks at your Facebook, whatever. They see you have pictures with your grandkids, especially if they're teenagers or young adults. They look, they follow and they find your grandkids' social media. Oh, your grandkid is over in France because they're posting pictures of the Eiffel Tower and stuff like that. They'll contact you and, and, and either say, hey, uh, you know, your, your, your grandkids uh, in trouble in France, they uh, got arrested, were in the wrong place at the wrong time, but they're in jail and, you know, they're going to, they, they need a thousand dollars bail right away um, because it's in France. You know, you, you, you can't, we need you to like go get a prepaid card and send us the number. And you're, grandkids in France, it's the middle of the night in France and you can't get a hold of them, whatever. And people panic and they go do that because it's their grandkid. And your grandkid probably isn't even in France, but 
you know, that that's uh, that's the type of thing that they do. Um, so if you ever fall for a scam, because like I said, it happens so often, you know, people get embarrassed, but in, you know, they, you really shouldn't be because the reason you get all these emails is because people fall for them all the time. Think of the people that, you know, fell for Bernie Madoff's scam, how many billions of dollars got lost. So if you ever are uh, hit by a scam, you know, don't panic, remain calm, immediately go in and change all of your passwords. If you know what was stolen, like you, fig like you, found, you figured out, oh crap, I just went to this website, gave them my name, my address, <clears throat> my phone number and my credit card. Uh, you know, make a list of everything that was stolen, track all the communications, print and save all the emails. <clears throat> After it happens, make sure you monitor your credit report. So if any, if they try to do anything, and this could be many, many, many months after the actual scam, you can immediately take action, <clears throat> notify any of the credit card companies and financial institutions where the, they gave the information from. And you can contact local law enforcement. Um, generally speaking, the local law enforcement doesn't do anything about it uh, because it's not their purview. But if it was a lot of money, um, I would actually uh, contact um, the local US attorney and or the state division of consumer fraud or something like that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about safer email habits. Never follow links or instructions from unknown or untrusted sources. Meaning, unless you know that the email is really from somebody you know, and unless you, you know that it is a legitimate link, don't follow it. Don't click on it. Uh, I got an email from my cousin saying, hey, there was, there's this article, blah, 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 here. And I'm looking at the URL, and it's just a funny looking URL. So I didn't click on it. I went and sent him a separate email saying, hey, did you send me an email about this? And he's like, nope. So just be hypersensitive. Um, Never send sensitive information through the email. This actually happened today. Um, I'm dealing with the Chicago Teachers Union pension system because when my aunt passed away, uh, you know, there, there's a death benefit that myself and my other two brothers get, you know, a couple of thousand dollars. So we filled out all the forms, we sent them in, nothing happened. My sister-in-law called them. She said, oh, uh, you forgot to attach a copy of your photo ID to it. So I had her email, I said, okay, is it, is it okay to fax my a copy of the photo ID to you? And she came back and she said, yes, you can fax it or email it. Emailing a copy of your photo ID is not a good idea, okay? It's convenient, but like I said, people monitor emails all the time. People's email accounts are hacked all the time. If her teacher's union email account gets hacked, the hacker has your photo ID. So, you know, fax it. You do it the old fashioned way. Especially, and log out when you're done, especially if you're on a public computer. We talked about phishing. You know, it's, uh, a trustworthy source, uh, or it's, it's an email with from a trustworthy source that's trying to get you to trust it and then get your private information. So they're typically something like this. And I'm going to stop sharing this for a minute and pull up something else. Share screen. Where is it? There it is. Okay, 
So, so this is an email from Chase. It has a Chase logo. Your customer, your counted Chase has been disabled due to attempted failed logins. Okay. So first thing that tells you this is a fake is look at who the email's from. It's not from customer support at chase.com. It's from this WordPress cloud, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a different place. That's the first signal. This is a phishing email. Now, we're gonna recover your account. Okay, so unfortunately, this isn't showing up like it did earlier. But when you hover over a URL, if it was really on a web page and not cut and paste into a document, down in the lower left corner of the browser, and this isn't a browser, but it would be in the lower left corner of the browser, you'll get a, in, in small type the actual URL it's going to. And very often in these things, again, it won't be a legitimate Chase URL, but you have to re look at it closely because it might be, um, you know, it might be account re you know, reset or it might be like HTTPS slash support dot chase dot Russian server farm, of course, it wouldn't be that, but there's some other name, dot joe.com slash, you know, reset. So if the URL looks funny at all, don't click on it. If you receive this email and you're afraid that it might be legitimate, don't click on anything open up your browser and go directly to the Chase site and log directly into your account on the Chase site, not through the link in the email. There, there are other hints, like see, it says your account at Chase has been disabled due to attempted failed logins. But then all of a sudden it's talking about if we determine the transactions was were authorized or correct, we will reverse the funds from your account and notify you. Your personal details is protected. So there, there, you know, some of these have really bad grammar. Some of them, you know, there's subtle bad grammar. Um, so just be skeptical when you get any of these emails and, you know, sort, sort of think, you know, it's, it's very much like the when you're in out, out outside in a big city in in you know an environment they say always be aware of your surroundings the internet version of that is always be aware of what you're clicking on and if it looks funny at all don't do it and if it's something like a bank account or something like that go into and open a new browser window and go to and log in through your normal way and don't do on any of these click here, click this to, to open. So I will stop sharing this, go back to sharing where we were. and figure out we only have a little bit. So th th this, this is pretty much what I was talking about. Um, so this, this is another sort of scam. This is you're surfing and all of a sudden you get this pop-up, Windows security alert. Uh, help protect your computers, Windows web security, have detected Trojans is ready to remove them. Do not click on remove all. This is a scam. What's happening is 
you're on this website and this is just a, a, a pop-up coming from the website that was designed to look like it was an alert from Windows. It may be very, very legitimate, but it may be very, very fake. You click on remove all and they're gonna install malware in your computer. What do you do when you see this? Close the browser. If you're in Chrome or Safari or uh, Firefox or Edge, close the browser if, and close the alert. And then run your antivirus, anti-malware software scan. If it's a legitimate problem, your antivirus or anti-malware software will find it. Mark, I've had this uh, several times on my computer. Yep. And uh, the only way I can get it off is to close out the whole computer mm -hmm. and re reopen, you know, have it reopen itself. Right. Um, now, my, my daughter can take it out because she's a web person, but uh, you try to delete, 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 it doesn't work. So I just close everything out as best I can. If it doesn't close, I close the computer. Right. Let it stay off for, you know, half a minute or so, and then it's gone. Right. So, so th <laughs> these things work in different ways. You know, the, the one you're talking about is somehow you went to a website that was either an illegitimate website or it was a legitimate website that had been hacked, and, and they're installing this software that just keeps opening different pages and stuff like that. And, you know, the, yeah, typically when you get those that you, you, there, the windows are opening faster than you can close them. Absolutely. Uh, you, you, you basically have to shut down and then what you typically you can do one or two things. Sometimes once you shut down, the cache is cleared and it goes away. Uh, but sometimes they install this as, as your as your home page, and so you, you have to do other things. But one of the easiest things in Windows is um, you set it you set your system to create restore points, and then you go back into the system and you just go to the previous restore point, and, and that'll get rid of this. And uh, it, you may, it, it, it's doing restore points isn't beginner stuff. It's, you, know, you have to know a little bit about what you're doing, but you can go find a YouTube video that shows you how to set up restore points and, and, and um, how to uh, set your computer back to a previous restore point. Mark, could I ask you uh, three questions or should I wait to the end? Uh, it's, it's up to you. Okay, I'll ask. Uh, okay. My uh, first question is, if I want to send a Word document as an attachment, if I use Windows en encryption to en encrypt the document, uh, can I feel that document will be safe? So if you're using, like are you using uh, a zip password, are you actually using something like uh, PGP? Or no, I, I'm just I have a Word document, right? Okay, I encrypt it and then I send it as an attachment, right? Okay, so you know, in general, encryption uh, can will keep it from getting um, like uh, from being modified because if, if essentially all if they if they try to modify the encrypted document. It will it won't decrypt, right? So if you send an encrypted document, um, like using the the and I forget what it's called, but the security and protection in Word, um, what what or 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 a third party Windows whatever, um, the encrypted document if it's modified at all, won't decrypt. So. Uh, that's a way to ensure that what you sent um, 
uh, is received by the person and they can decrypt it. If it decrypts, it hasn't been modified. And, and to a certain extent, that's, that's the technology that's used for digital signatures. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually have three security uh, products. Mm -hmm. I have Windows Defender, okay. Ethernet, Malware Bytes. Yeah. Windows Defender, I understand, hibernates when it detects that there are other security products running. And I, I've been told by different authorities conflicting views about ESET and malware bytes. One says they're fine to use together. The other says don't use them both at the same time. Yeah, um, and, and I'll be honest, I'm not familiar with um, either of those. Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, my, in my day job, I'm dealing mostly with Linux security. Um, for our products, the, uh, the there's all sorts of um, you know various malware detection and things like that. Some are more popular than others. Obviously, some are commercial programs and some are freeware. Um, you know, my recommendation and the the fact that some people say use them together, some people say don't, doesn't surprise me. Uh, what I would do is, is look for, you know, a credible, well-known security authority uh, and what they have to say on it. People like Bruce Schreiner or Brian Krabs or um, I guess Gene Spafford's retired. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're people who are, you, you know, are, you know, they have their security B logs and they're, you know, they have, you know, thousands or millions of followers and stuff like that. Because, you know, the, the problem is, is just, just like in medicine and other things, different doctors have different opinions, different security professionals have different opinions. My, uh, my final question or comment uh, regards security, uh, being maybe forced to use security products, you know, based upon the pipeline experience. Do you think the government should get involved and require companies that have a major impact on the public or national defense uh, purchase security software? I'm gonna pass on answering that. Because uh, one, I want that it could turn into another, you know, fifty-minute debate, um, and and two, uh, you know, it, 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 um, I, I I just you know, my opinion really doesn't matter uh, on something like that. That's more a public policy thing, and here the, the whole the whole thing is to talk mostly about uh, you know, keeping yourself safe. If you want to have a, an offline discussion about it, uh, you know, we can certainly do that, but I, I don't think it's appropriate for, for this call, if you don't mind, Dan. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, again, another one of these pop-ups, uh, Apple Web Security. There really is no such thing as Apple Web Security. It's called something else. Okay, we talked about this back up your data. It's very, very easy to do today. Most external thumb drives and get external thumb drives with, you know, 256 megabytes of data, uh, you know, storage or gigabytes, not megabytes for $40. You can get a small external hard drive with five terabytes for $100. Um, and almost all of them come with backup software installed. You know, it's literally put it in, click on something, and it'll do the backup for you. And you should back up, uh, and there are also cloud services. Um, if, you, if you have a Google account, you get 15 gigabytes of, uh, 
you know, Google Drive storage and they have uh, Google Sync, which you can set up and it'll back up whatever files you want automatically to that 15 gigabytes uh, on the cloud. And if you need more, uh, it's like $20 a year for 100 gigabytes. Um, so it's very convenient. Uh, someone, some statistics I've seen say only 25% of people back up their data. And even those don't back it up regularly. Um, I've been burned more than once in my life by using relatively important things with, with not backing up. Uh, you don't want to know my backup strategy because uh, just I like in my photography business, I have about 25 terabytes of data on disks on my photography computer, but I back up uh, the, the main files, uh, like uh, to uh, Amazon, and I pay $18 a month for 16 terabytes of storage. So th drives are cheap, storage is cheap, um, backups are easy, just do it. Mark? Yes? Uh, what kind of file structure do you use to get to a specific photo in a reasonable amount of time? So for me, uh, everything is indexed by date. And because I did fashion and glamor photography, okay. it, it's indexed by date and by model. Yeah. And uh, I, I actually use uh, Adobe Lightroom and it keeps a complete catalog with all the metadata. So I can bring it up and do a search and find it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, download, streaming. We, you know, we, we all download, well, we don't all, most of us download music, most of us watch videos. We occasionally download apps. Uh, we all have HBO, Netflix. Um, some of us play online games. Just make sure you're going to a legitimate site um, you know, sometimes people will go to these off name sites because, you know, they have um, Game of Thrones for free. Uh, first, it probably was pirated if it's for free. And second, um, it probably has malware on it. So uh, back in the day when people used, you know, things like uh, BitTorrent and Torrents uh, to share music, um, it was also the way many, many, many viruses got propagated. So, you know, you're, you're much better off paying, uh, you know, $15 a month for um, Apple Music or $4 a month, whatever it is, for Apple Music or for Rhapsody or for one of those things than going to one of these free sites and um, risking getting a uh, malware installed and then getting hacked and losing all your information. Okay, a couple of things about social media. Um, you really should get people's permission before posting pictures of others. Um, it's both common courtesy, uh, but it, it, the people you may inadvertently cause harm to someone by post, like, let's think of our typical uh, singles travel thing. We're, in, we're on a cruise, we're in Greece, we're in some restaurant, we take some photos and we post them. Well, what we didn't know was that uh, June is actually in the witness protection program. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and you've now just she is rot, 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 rot. <laughs> <laughs> see that's something I knew that you didn't tell me <laughs> uh, June our June is not in the witness protection program to the best of my knowledge but I, I'm, be, I'm using an extreme example um, 
certainly don't put sensitive information on social media. I had a model who was a good friend of mine at one point who was in Miami. Uh, she was living in a subletted condo and the sublet ended and she and her roommate went and, and sublet another condo. And the first thing she did was she put a picture of herself with the condo building in the background saying, my new home. And I said, Kelly, you just realize you, every one of your fans, some of who are borderline stalkers, as we've talked about, now knows where you live. Think before you post. Um, it's important. Do not post that you are going out of town. That's an invitation to the burglars to come burgle your house. Okay. Um, and to paraphrase the famous Las Vegas phrase, what goes on the internet stays on the internet. Once it's on the internet, it is not gone. Even if you go and you delete that tweet or you delete exactly. that Facebook post, there are people scraping and copying everything that's posted. Um, again, we talked about the, the, the person thing, um, you know, a, a, a more legitimate th you know, thing that can, you know, is somebody may be trying to uh, not have a former significant other know where they are and what they're doing. Um, posting pictures while on vacation, and Tammy's going to hate this. <laughs> Again, it's a signal to people who are monitoring your account. You're not at home. Um, you know, uh, and, and again, you know, if if the background is very generic and could be a bar in the town, okay, maybe it's okay. But if you're on the beach in Greece and you live in Madison, Wisconsin it's sort of obvious you're not in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and geotagging is an interesting thing because, you know, even if you're doing a headshot of some of, of yourself, somebody's you know, taking it or you're doing a selfie, if you have geotagging on, even if you don't say where it's at, it tells them where you're at. So, and uh, you can go into the settings and deactivate geotagging just for photos. Um, we won't go into this. We don't have time, but you can do it in your phone. You can look it up. Um, so think before you click. Make sure you have your antivirus protection on and keep it updated. Keep your software updated. Back up everything. Use strong passwords. Um, and like I said, one, one way to do that is to create a little algorithm for yourself on how you create the passwords that nobody but you would know, but it's easy for you to remember. Be careful or don't use public Wi-Fi. Uh, question what you see in emails and pop-ups, don't believe it. Um, only download and stream from proper sites. Don't post sensitive information on social media. And think of every email and phone call as fraudulent until you've proven to yourself it isn't. So I have one more chart that I wanna share with people, which is sort of the same thing, but um, where's the stop share? Sort of the same thing, but specifically for travel. And we've gone over some of this, so we'll go over it quickly. So again, when you're traveling, avoid using public Wi-Fi, because even more than a Starbucks or you know, a, a cafe or a restaurant in town, in tourist areas, the hackers are definitely on the public Wi-Fi because they know that cafe that has the, the open Wi-Fi free internet at the end of the dock when you get off the cruise ship they know everybody's going in there and attaching to the internet. So it, it, it's like, uh, you know, 
being you know being in the fishing hole where you know all the fish are gonna are gonna be there um i think um talk about vpn earlier vpn stands for virtual private network you can get software that you can install on your laptop on your tablets on your phone that automatically protects the information from things like being sniffed on public Wi-Fi because it sets up a encrypted pipe between your phone or your tablet and a server somewhere. And they, most of the services have servers in many countries. You can also use VPN to get around location restrictions. So if you have Netflix and you're gonna be spending a week in uh, um, Crete with our, uh, with our group in Crete or our group in Sicily, and you think you may want to watch some Netflix, the problem is when you're in Crete and you try to access Netflix, it's gonna say, oh, you're in Crete you're not allowed to, to watch that movie because it, we don't have the licensing for Crete. But what the VPNs allow you to do is to fake uh, the connection so that your phone connect goes from Crete back to the, not your phone, but the data path goes from Crete back to a server in the US and then tries to connect to Netflix from the US and basically, oh, now you can watch your Netflix. Um, VPN software costs 12 to $15 a month, typically for up to five different devices. If you buy it for a year or two years, it goes down to like three or four or $5 a month. Um, if you only really worry about, like I use VPN all the time. Um, if you are really only worried about it when you're traveling, you can buy one month of service and just use it when you're traveling. Um, Which products do you recommend? Um, so uh, there's, for, for someone who, who's comfortable with the technology, um, ExpressVPN or NordVPN are, are and again, everybody has their different ratings, but they're consistently rated as the top uh, in the top five. Um, there's a, and it's, it, I think it's Surfwatch is another good one, but it, it's it's not as sophisticated, but it's easier to set up and use for the people who are less savvy. You just basically install it, answer a couple of questions, and it just works. Um, so, so those are, those are the three I would recommend. Thank you. Okay. But, you know, if, if you do something like, um, I think, you know, the way it's packaged now, if you get Norton 360, which now includes LifeLock, which I'm sure you've heard about, and uh, the anti-malware and stuff like that. I think a VPN comes with that. And that VPN is fine. I just, I personally wouldn't spend the money, uh, you know, the hundred dollars a year or whatever it is for that big subscription. Um, so, you know, the, the, like Express and Nord are, are well-rated and popular, uh, but any of the big, you know, uh, malware suites, if they include their own VPN, they're fine. They're probably just, they're not as, um, they're not as fast and, and things like that. Um, so protect all your devices with passwords or pins. That means, you know, have a pin set on your phone and on your tablet. Um, definitely when you're traveling, don't bring all of your devices, travel with minimum devices. Typically when I'm traveling with Single Life Today, I have my phone and I bring my iPad. I don't bring one of my four laptops. I certainly don't bring my three desktop computers. So 
uh, but all of my devices, even my uh, desktop computers at home are all, I need a password to log into them when, when I start them up because that means if somehow they disappear, it's a little harder for the person who gets the, who stole the computer to be able to log in and use it. Um, again, limit the social media posts regarding your vacation. All of the people who, who are your friends on Facebook, how many of them would you vouch for to say, I know this person will never do harm to anybody? A lot of them maybe, but I'm sure you have a lot of casual you know, friends of friends who are your friends on Facebook. And for all you know, one of them is a career criminal. Does um, it pay well? Uh, <laughs> it, 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 if you don't know that they're a career criminal, maybe it is paying well because you don't know. Do you have to wear a suit? Uh, uh, I, I think you wear one of those, uh, you know, orange is the new black things. <laughs> um, okay, we talked about backing up your data, two-factor authentication. Um, every site where I have an account that allows you to use, set up two-factor authentication, I do. Um, it's an extra step, but it really adds an extra layer of protection. So whether it's my Gmail, whether it's my banking, my PayPal, um, my Amazon, uh, I, I always use two-factor authentication. And I'm sure uh, just to reiterate what happens is after you type in your, your username and password, you basically get some sort of prompt where either they automatically send you a text with a six digit, normally it's six digits, sometimes it's more six digit code, or they'll ask you, do you want a, a phone call? Do you want a text to, to your, re your registered text number? Do you want it to your registered email? And they send you uh, that code then you type it in. And again, the whole idea of two-factor authentication is you, you need two things. It's something you know, your user ID and password, and it's something you have. You'll only get that code if you're holding on to your phone or your, you can log into your email. Um, two-factor authentication used to have little um, hardware, little devices that would give you the code then they came up with software apps that give you the code, but pretty much most of the industry has moved to doing it by text, even though it's not quite as secure as the, the authentication applications, uh, they've gone to the text thing because it's much simpler for the user uh, to, to deal with. So uh, it, it's become pretty common practice. Practice safe surfing. That means just don't click around uh, randomly without knowing where you're going. Uh, a side comment here is part of what I do, I have to do a lot of research on the web when I'm researching uh, new software and issues and things like that. I have a special browser that I use to, to surf that's uh, in what we call a, a sandbox, which means it's completely isolated from the rest of the computer. So that even if I uh, click on a, a link that installs malware, it's not really installing it on my computer, it's installing it in a, in essentially a separate virtual machine that if, if I, it get, gets installed, I just, get out of the virtual machine, go into my main computer, delete the virtual machine and create a new one. Uh, I know that's much more sophisticated than uh, most people can or want to do. And I do that specifically because when I'm doing research, I'm often going to sites I'm not familiar with. When I'm at home and browsing normal stuff, 
I don't click on going to sites I don't know. Like if I'm doing research because I need, I want to buy, uh, you know, some like new tech gadget. There's sites that I know are legitimate: Tech Radar, Gizmodo, you know, CNET. Um, and then there are other sites I won't click on because I don't know that they're legitimate. Uh, keep Bluetooth turned off if you're not using it. Um, there are exploits with Bluetooth and even my, typically my Bluetooth on my iPhone uh, is always in explore mode, finding other Bluetooth devices. Uh, but when I'm traveling, I turn the auto discovery off um, so that I don't accidentally connect to something I don't want to connect to. But um, yeah, the, there are Bluetooth exploits, but the, they're not as common as they used to be. Because now that there are hotspots everybody where uh, they, the hackers find uh, exploiting the Wi-Fi much more uh, lucrative. Before you leave, make sure you've updated all your antivirus and anti-malware software. And the last thing was disable auto connect on all your devices because when you're at home, auto connecting is no big deal. Uh, when you're traveling, you're probably auto connecting to a compromised uh, Wi-Fi. So <sighs> that was about half an hour longer than it was supposed to be. Uh, but it was excellent, Mark. I liked it. Yeah. So um, that's all I have to present. Uh, Tammy, do we want to do Q&A on the recording or after? Well, thank you. Yeah, Mark, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And I am going to um, turn off the recording for those of you who are members watching this on YouTube in the future. Thanks for joining. Um, well worth the time invested tonight. And we look forward to seeing you again on Single Life today.